Welcome to the European Parliamentary Research Service podcasts. In this podcast, we'll focus on one organization that has become a pillar of the modern European security order, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, or OSCE. Get ready for some history. The OSCE's origins can be traced back to the Cold War, when Europe was divided into two opposing blocs. The Soviet Union wanted the West to acknowledge the post-Second World War order, which made it the dominant power in Eastern Europe, while the West wanted the Soviet Union to commit to upholding basic human rights. The result was the Helsinki Final Act, signed in 1975. This founded the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, or CSCE, the organization which later evolved into the OSCE. The CSCE became a multilateral forum for dialogue and negotiation between East and West. And while the Soviets had no intention of honoring their human rights commitments, dissidents added to the pressure for change by setting up groups to monitor implementation of the commitments made at Helsinki. Some historians even see the final act as the first step towards ending communist rule. In the Charter of Paris for a new post-Cold War European order signed in 1990, the CSCE was called upon to play its part in the historic changes taking place in Europe and addressing the new challenges of the post-Cold War period. The CSCE was then renamed as the OSCE and given a permanent headquarters in Vienna. Douglas Wake is senior expert at the OSCE. It was really an historic breakthrough in the 1975 Helsinki Final Act for leaders to agree that security involves not only traditional political and military relations, but also economic and environmental cooperation and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. So first the CSEE and later the OSCE have embodied the concept that it's impossible to separate relations among governments from the way they treat their own people. The 57 OSCE states have since made very detailed commitments in areas ranging from military transparency to democracy and good governance. Let's look at the political and military dimension in greater detail. With the end of the Cold War, the possibility of bringing the two halves of the continent together became more real. But hopes that the OSCE could become the central pillar of a new post-Cold War order faded as divisions re-emerged between an enlarged EU and NATO on the one hand and Russia on the other. Despite not evolving into a full-blown military alliance, the OSCE still plays an important role as a framework for agreements that aim to reduce the risk of military conflict. One of these is the so-called Vienna Document, which requires OSCE countries to keep each other informed about the size and structure of their armed forces and to notify one another on big military exercises. Even though not all OSCE countries honour these commitments, military transparency is vitally important. It helps to build trust and reduce the risk of conflict, a far cry from the Cold War, when secrecy surrounded the size of the Warsaw Pact forces and the fear of war loomed over Europe. This is part of the arms control, confidence and security building measures that lie at the core of the OSCE's political and military dimension. As the only pan-European security organization, the OSCE also plays an active role in conflict management and has helped mediate many of the disputes and conflicts that have broken out in the countries of the former Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. The recent crisis in Ukraine shows both the limitations and the value of the organization. On the one hand, powerless to end the fighting, it served as a vital channel to keep communication open between the two sides and discuss pressing issues such as humanitarian access, water, supplies and civilian travel between government and separatist-controlled areas. And with more than 700 staff on the ground, the OSCE's special monitoring mission to Ukraine has become its largest field operation ever and often the only reliable source of information on what's really happening in Donbass. For example, when Ukrainian separatists shot down flight MH17, killing all 300 passengers and crew on board, OSCE monitors were the first to arrive on the scene. But the OSCE does much more than this. Let's now turn to the economic and environmental dimension. Dana Bogdan is Environmental Programme Officer within the OSCE. 
recognizing the importance of economic and environmental considerations in ensuring peace, safety and security, the OEC supports its participating states in assessing potential security risks related to economic and environmental factors. By cooperating on good governance, sustainable development, economic and environmental protection issues, the OEC helps bridge differences and build trust between states. Certainly laudable efforts, though with a budget of just under 4 million euros for all economic and environmental activities, it cannot have more than a local impact. So what about the human dimension? Although human rights standards in Western European countries and the former Soviet Union have always been somewhat different, the OSCE builds its work on a very clear premise. Lasting security can never be achieved without respect for human rights. And while consensus-based decision-making doesn't make strong action easy, the organization is not completely powerless in the face of serious human rights violations. But perhaps the activity which the OSCE is best known for is election observation. Katia Andrush speaks for the OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights. The OSCE Office for Democratic Institutions and Human Rights, or ODEA, works across the 57 states of the OSCE region to support and strengthen democratic institutions, promote the rule of law, protect human rights, and work towards tolerant societies. One of ODIA's key activities is election observation, which begins long before election day and ends well afterwards. It also includes support to national authorities in their efforts to improve their electoral process for the benefit of all citizens. That's a lot of very ambitious goals in all three dimensions, but only limited means of achieving them. Indeed. An annual budget of around 140 million euros is certainly a small amount considering the vast thematic and geographical scope of its operations. This, combined with the disagreements between participating states that all too often stall decision-making, have weakened the organisation. Yet, despite its limitations and shortcomings, the OSCE still has a vital role to play. As the world's largest regional security organisation, extending from Vancouver to Vladivostok, it has showed its value as a forum for pan-European security cooperation. Promoting military transparency, monitoring conflicts, observing elections, supporting democratic reforms across Europe and the former Soviet Union, and upholding human rights in Eastern Europe. If you want to know more about the past, the present and the future of the OSCE, check out Martin Russell's briefing on the EPRS website. This is a European Parliamentary Research Service podcast. Thanks for listening.